What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to My Social Life. This is the podcast where you can hear the real stories behind the people on social media. I'm your host, Jacob Kelly. And before we get into today's conversation with Alex Gassaway, there's a couple things that we need to go over first. Number one, if you enjoyed today's podcast, please consider leaving a rating and a review. The more positive ratings and reviews we get, the more it helps new people find the show and it really helps to grow the community that we're developing. And if you're one of those people that have recently found the podcast, welcome. I'm very excited to have you here. Make sure you subscribe and stay tuned for future episodes. To everybody listening, make sure you screenshot this, post it to your Instagram story, tag at the Jacob Kelly and at Alex Gasway, and I'll feature you on the account and send you a message as well. Now, without further ado, let's get to my conversation with Alex Gasway. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to My Social Life. This is the podcast where you can hear the real stories behind the people on social media. I'm your host, Jacob Kelly, and today we're joined by Alex Gasway. And Alex is a tech and media company founder, and she's a YouTuber who makes content about creativity, business, and purpose. And I'm very excited to have her here on the podcast today. Alex, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. It's my pleasure. So where I want to start this, I want to go all the way back. So can you just kind of tell everyone where you grew up and what you were like as a kid? Ooh, this is, this is good. Wow. <laughs> um, taking it way back, I grew up in Indiana. Midwest girl, small town, um, played a lot of sports. That's probably the main the main thing that all my time was spent doing. Um, basketball, soccer, tennis um, were my main sports. And yeah, just just loved that and didn't actually, I think the first time I found my passion for film um, in Hollywood was really just watching trailers and movie trailers and thought that I wanted to cut trailers for, for a living. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't know what else you want to know about my childhood, but yeah, just small town, small town, hanging out with friends, not a lot to do, um, besides play sports. That's fair. And then if my research is correct, you got your first camera right before college. Yeah. Yeah. My parents got me a Canon 60D. I think I had to pay for part of it. I'm pretty sure I had to spend some dough on that myself as well, but they paid for a bulk of a Canon 60D as my high school graduation gift. And then so like, what was the reasoning behind you wanting to get that camera? I know you mentioned there that you wanted to cut the trailers. So was it to kind of film trailers so you could cut them yourselves or what was kind of the intention behind wanting a camera initially? Yeah, it was, it's actually kind of hard to remember. I know that, um, I had started shooting some videos almost as like class projects in high school um, and always thought that that was the most fun way to complete a project for sure. Um, It felt way less like homework that way. Um, I honestly, I don't really recall why that was like, yeah, that should be my high school graduation gift. Other than the fact that I knew I enjoyed video, I knew I wanted to work in the film industry, um, but I don't remember having like a like an intentional thought that, oh, you should shoot your own films, right, to edit and cut trailers. So I, (laughs) that's a horrible answer, but I'm not really sure, (laughs) other than I knew I liked videos. Yeah, and then so ultimately, like, what did you end up going to school for? Was it for, like, film production that you went to school for, or was it something else? Yeah, I went to a liberal arts university in Indiana, and I joined their media honors program. So I knew I'd be heading into that. And they had a newspaper and a TV station um, and a radio station. And um, I studied communications and film studies. And I had looked at different film uh, film schools out in LA and everything and just personal circumstances. And the basketball team um, kind of pushed me in that in that direction to where I ended up going so they didn't have like a film production program um but yeah film studies and communication then heavily involved in like the student television station there and I actually want to talk about basketball a little bit as well it's like when did the possibility of playing NCAA ball kind of start to become a reality Mm. um when I was four (laughs) um no I think I I knew I mean when I was a kid I wanted to play in the WNBA you know um but yeah, I looked at Division One schools and, and different scholarship opportunities and um, ultimately at some point knew that I wasn't going to be able to play in the WNBA, 5'10 forward here. Um, <laughs> but uh, so that kind of got me to look more at liberal arts colleges. My dad worked at a liberal arts college my whole life. Um, so looking at Division Three, I, I, I knew 
my whole high school career and whole middle school career that I was going to play in college. Um, it was really a choice of what sport I wanted to play, but basketball was my, was, was the sport I was most passionate about. Um, I got the most joy from. So yeah, just deciding between division one and division three was really, was really where it was at for me throughout high school. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was a sport you were most passionate at, but it's also a sport you're really good at too. If my research is correct, you led your team in scoring in the 2012-2013 season? Mm-hmm, yep. And then can you also talk about what it was like, and now again, correct me if I'm wrong, but what it was like to win the NCAA Division Three tournament? Yes. Yeah, we were undefeated national champions that year. Um, I really chose uh, DePaul was the university I went to. Um, they had a really, really good basketball program. And so that drove me uh, to go to that school and the Media Fellows uh, Media Honors Program. Um, but yeah, winning a national championship, I mean, I is still talking, it's funny talk, it's like funny cross-pollinating these worlds, um, talking about athletics and um, on a, like a, you know, social media podcast. But uh, yeah, as a, as, a, as a girl, I can still picture myself in the driveway of my, you know, childhood home. And like, just like, uh, playing the announcer while I'm like shooting around like shooting hoops and like winning at then it was like a state tournament, right. In high school. And then like a national, uh, national championship and all that, just any kind of championship. Right. So having that actually all of your hard work turn into actually accomplishing a national championship is, is pretty a powerful experience in terms of like work ethic and, and seeing your hard work pay off like that. Mm-hmm. And actually, that's kind of a perfect segue because I was just going to ask, what are some lessons that you've taken away from your time playing basketball? But I guess that would be one of them. Is there any other ones that you kind of that stick out that you're able to share? Yeah, this is funny that we're talking about this actually because I've been kind of playing around with a, a concept for a video or maybe something different in the future on this topic because um, I know a ton of people have different experiences with athletics and actually I haven't met a ton of creators that like were huge into athletics when they were kids. Um, but like the concept of what a national championship has taught me about like creating an entrepreneurship. Um, it's, it's a weird thing to like a lot of schools that we played, their, their goal was winning a, or getting into a conference tournament or winning a conference tournament. And our goal was always winning a national championship all four years I was at I was in college, um, and kind of looking towards that North star every day while you go to work on the court. Um, it's, it's directly linked to how I look at entrepreneurship now. Um, and understanding that, you know, this sucks. Maybe this is painful. Maybe this is hard right now. Um, but if you keep doing what you know will get you the end result, like you'll, you'll get there. Um, that's definitely the key thing that I've taken away from that experience. It's just discipline and hard work and also communication and teamwork and just all those things that you, when you're a kid, you don't necessarily realize you're learning and taking away from athletics, but looking back, it definitely has changed my life in that way. Yeah, no, that's awesome. And then, so ultimately, when did you end up moving out? Cause you said DePaul was in Indiana. So when did you, when and why did you ultimately move to LA? So yeah, I had looked at colleges in Los Angeles and decided to stay in Indiana, but um, which I'm very glad that I did, but it was always my dream to live in Los Angeles, um, which has shifted from wanting to work in the entertainment industry to what I'm doing now, but still it's a great place to do what I'm doing. We actually moved out here, was it 20, 2015, no, 2016 I moved out here, so I Stayed in Indiana one year after I graduated in 2014. Then I moved to St. Louis because my now wife was in physical therapy school at Washington University, St. Louis. And then we moved out basically the year after that um, to L.A. And I started my graduate program. I actually got my MBA uh, a couple years ago. So that's a whole nother story. Yeah, that's awesome. And then when did YouTube start for you? Like when did you first pick up a camera and kind of turn it around and start recording yourself? Oh, recording myself. Yeah, that's a whew, that's a big step as a creator. Um, at least it was for me because I had been basically um, in the since I graduated college was starting to make videos for businesses, and it was a whole discovery that that was even a thing that I could do um, in the Midwest because there just isn't obviously the same film industry as there is on the coast. Um, 
so I had been making videos obviously since I since I got that camera I made videos all throughout college and then started you know making a little bit of money from different people that I knew uh, making videos for them in the Midwest and then um kind of moved that along with me out to LA when I was in grad school and um finally turned the camera around as an experiment for a YouTube channel I did like a 45 day uh, crowdfunding campaign for a short film that I was making as part of my graduate program um and I tried to do a daily like vlog I guess or a daily like update about the crowdfunding campaign and different ways to crowdfund for a short film um I was also getting married in the middle of that which is just like it's just a lot um so I think I ended up doing like 30 30 some videos in 45 days and that was the first time I was really filming myself and I've used some clips from those videos in recent um kind of films that I've made on my channel just looking back at how like awkward and how you're just like you have no idea what your voice is and you're just starting out and trying to figure out how to be in front of the camera it's such a weird process when you've been behind it for so many years yeah and then and then was it from that experience of making those 30 37 38 videos in 45 days did that kind of get like the bug in you to start doing your own channel and created like when you created your first like the alex gasway channel did that start shortly after that Um, Those were on my Alex Gasway channel, but um, I was still in grad school, actually. So I had one more year of my MBA program left. So I didn't start right away after that. But it was a really good kind of segue into thinking more about that and thinking, like, is this something I want to pursue? And then it was probably like 10 months later that I uploaded my first more like gear review tutorial stuff. um, And I had committed to making one video a month. And so that would, that would have been, what year was that? That would have been like April, 2018, I think. And then, so how did you get from committing to one video a month to deciding to go daily again and daily vlog? Good question. I remember sitting in my studio one night, like late, I was up late editing a client project and just like almost like daydreaming about YouTube too. Cause like, that's what I really wished I had the, had been doing at the moment and finishing the client project and, and just like sitting there and putting the camera up and just like talking to the camera. I was, it was like a weird, like self therapy session. I was just talking to the camera and I had actually seen, um, been watching Cody Warner, um, and his daily vlog. And he's just so good at encouraging people and motivating people to just do things. And, yeah, it was at that time that I just decided that I should just be documenting and just uh, just be creating more often on YouTube. Um, I wanted to see more women in the space, and I figured I should just do that and be that <laughs> woman in the space. So, yeah, weird, weird, weird change from one video to daily videos. It's just like a wild, it's a wild commitment. But talk to my wife and she okayed it so I just I decided to do it <laughs> yeah and I wanted to ask about the process too because like a daily vlog is always something that I've been like I want to I want to do this and there was a point in I think it was May June when I had a moment where I was like you know I'm in a daily vlog and I filmed my first one I put it out and I said the start of going daily and then I think that was like the last video I posted on my YouTube channel was the start of my daily vlog and there wasn't even a second day so I'm just I've seen that the- so many weird like you see that a lot actually <laughs> yeah so like I'm just curious about like the process of actually putting together a daily vlog and putting out something new every single day so like how do you come up with a new idea every day do you have like a note in your phone or is it just every morning kind of whatever whatever's top of mind at that time like how do you come up with a new idea <clears throat> yeah so my whole concept of the daily vlog was I'm building a software company and I was right at the beginning because I I had just graduated so I was my my MBA program so I was really kicking into gear on this business and so I wanted to just document the process both because I thought it would be fun to look back on and I thought it could be um, valuable content to some people Um, and also just hold myself accountable to make sure I'm actively doing things because I already had this production business but that's not what I want to do long term so it's like holding myself accountable for really building out this business Um, the so the concept there is you know documenting the entrepreneurial process (laughs) but it quickly like it's super boring to film yourself 
like the actual part of was just me sitting at the desk working all day. So I was like, okay, I'm not going to film that. I literally don't go anywhere most of the most of the work week. I'm just like working at my desk. So I ended up basically just trying to make every day of like a value content video for YouTube. Like, so something that right now I make every week or twice a week at most, I was trying to make every day. So they were just like really crappy value videos at that point. But in terms of like the idea eating process, I just, I use Asana and I have a very, very long list of uh, video ideas. And usually I think they're trash and they just sit there forever. Um, but a lot of times I, I recommend that people just keep that list and I very rarely delete from that list because I, I'm shocked at how often I'm scrolling through and these are trash, these are trash, whatever. And then something sparks, like that idea sparked an idea that I actually like. Um, so yeah, just like keeping, keeping your ideas in one place where you can see them and scroll through them and kind of work off of them is, is how I do it. And um, definitely recommend. And one thing I've heard you say too, with it when it comes to making videos is like, you usually need a story before you shoot. So like, is there a, like before you go to bed or in the morning when you wake up, do you kind of jot down some notes on how you think that story is going to take place and then film it? Or do you kind of find the story as you film and even in the edit? Um, I think it depends on what kind of video I'm making. Um, for, for instance, um, a video that I made about it's called did you did Casey Neistat change your life um, that a lot of people found me through um, that story was I guess both pre like in pre-production but also I found it in the edit so so a lot of people asked me about that video that same question so I would say like I had written out a script um, for parts that I w knew I needed to film while I was in New York. But then also as I got back and I was editing this five days worth of footage, I really was piecing together the story in the edit as well. And then kind of coming up with an outline for my talking points when I filmed more of a talking head interview portion back at home. And then from there, like the story really came together full force. Um, Cause you just never know, like in my experience for YouTube videos and making kind of like short films about, you the subject as as the character you never know how a day is going to go and you never know how it's just unpredictable um so i like to i basically almost always have a mix of pre-planned pre -plan story and also finding the story in the edit i actually wanted to ask you about the casey neistat video as well so can you kind of explain the idea behind that video for anyone that's never seen it like i watched it when i was kind of doing some prep work for this one and the video itself is just incredible. So you kind of explain where the idea came from and then what that idea is. Yeah, for sure. So the video is called Did Casey and I Sat Change Your Life? And really it's um, kind of an homage to, to the way Casey has changed the platform and changed the world of creation in general for um, people that are working outside of the traditional media industry. Um, and it was also a story, a personal story about how um, I've gone from wanting to maybe be a producer in Hollywood to um, launching a software company and, and being in this world of social impact and creativity and business. Um, so the concept basically derived from me getting invited to an event called Creators Offline at 368. And as soon as I found out that I was going to New York and I was going to 368, I knew I had to make something more epic than what I was making at the time. Um, I had to make a story out of it. So I actually saw an Instagram um, account that was going around the world and taking photos of film locations. So they'd print out a photo of the film and then they'd hold it in front of the lens and snap. They'd, they'd like line it up with the landscape around it and take a photo of that. So I had seen this Instagram account around for a little while and, you know, was just trying to think of ideas and actually came up with my feed and I was like, oh my gosh, that'd be really cool. So I went through all of Casey's, not all, but a lot of Casey's vlogs and found kind of like iconic spots of New York where he vlogs a lot. And so I took screen grabs of those and uh, printed them all out. It was super creepy when I walked into Walgreens and I have like 50, 50 <laughs> photos of Casey Neistat. Um, 
And so I went around his area where 368 is, all around Manhattan, really, and took photos of those photos in those locations. So that was kind of like my way of exploring New York um, and talking about how many of us have, you know, come to know New York through his, his through his lens. Um, so that's kind of the the concept of the video. Mm-hmm. And and that video took you like three and a half months to edit, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. So how did it feel to finally hit upload on that video? Oh man, I, I it's such a rush, like hitting upload. I, and of course, it's more so when you've spent a lot of time on a single video. Um, that one was kind of terrifying though, because you have spent so much time. <laughs> like this could get. This could get 80 views. Like, I think that was like the average that I was at at that moment. It was like 80 to 100 views over like the course of like five days. Um, So it's like, man, I just sunk so much time and energy into this video. It's like, it's super terrifying, but it's also like really invigorating because you just never know what's going to happen with the video. And did you have a feeling though when you hit upload, like this was going to do better than the average right now because it's sitting at over 50,000 views it's your most viewed video did you expect that when you hit upload or were you really not sure what to expect I didn't expect that at all I I honestly thought the video was awful (laughs) like like I feel like that's I don't know that's my experience with creating for myself and treating myself as a character on YouTube like I pretty much think all my videos are just like not worth uploading and I've actually had that happen several times where I wasn't planning to upload a video and I uploaded it and everyone was like super excited about it. And I literally only uploaded it because my, I needed an upload and my wife was like, you need to upload that. Just do it. So the same with the Casey video, honestly, like after you sit with a video for over three months and you're just working on it at a certain point, I feel like it's inevitable that you're just like, is this even worth it? Like, does this even make sense to anyone else but me? You know? Um, so that's kind of the same feeling that I had with that video, but, uh, still promote it and tag. I, I lucked out because I had interviewed people at three, six, eight. Um, and those people were gracious enough to share out the video. So I tagged people like Beck and Chris and Jesse Driftwood, Cody Warner. Um, they shared it out on Twitter immediately. And, uh, so that's kind of what helped it take off. I kind of want to just double back to that point there. You're saying we don't necessarily like most of your videos if that's the case can you explain to people why you keep creating though if you're constantly kind of running into that where you don't think this video is good enough why do you keep going and keep trying and keep creating another video after that wow <clears throat> that's a really I'm getting good a little question. deep here sorry i didn't know it was gonna go I, that really i love fast. deep i love deep it just had i have to think about that make my make me question my whole life here <laughs> um A big why for me is because I want there to be more women on this platform in, in this niche. Um, and I figure if I'm not willing to do it, then why would I expect other people to do it? Um, I also think that like I keep uploading because I think it's really fun. Um, it's fun to have a creative outlet for these ideas that I have. Like there's so many ideas over the last year and a half that would have just sat there and I never would have pursued if I didn't have just a place to put them. Even if, even if no one's seeing them and by no one, I mean, even if a hundred people are seeing them, then it's like, it, it causes me to have a reason to create these ideas. Otherwise, before I had YouTube and before I had my own channel, f- gigabytes and terabytes of footage sit on old hard drives that I've just never done. I've never even made the videos of the, of the trip or of that thing that I did that was really fun. So it's like, why, why am I filming these parts of my life if I'm not going to even edit a video out of them? So it's like a motivation to capture these, not just to capture, but to actually put together something tangible from something that you obviously thought was worth capturing. So I think that's a big part of why I love YouTube and I love having my own channel because it's it's a motivating factor in that way. Mm-hmm. I really like that. And one thing you said there too right at the beginning though was you felt that there's not enough like female representation and you're right. And so like why why do you think that is and what do what needs to happen in order to get more females creating on the platform and putting videos out, especially in th- your niche of like tech and entrepreneurship? Mm-hmm. 
Um, yeah, uh, some of my other women friends that are on the platform and are independent content creators we talk. We talk about this all the time, and it's a it's a hard one to answer. Um, and there's really not a single answer to it, but seeing other people on the platform, like if when YouTube started, like there were, or no, it's not even YouTube, but the film video and photo industry in general has lacked women representation throughout history. Um, and that's all changing right now. Um, and it's been changing, but that's, I think the most important part is seeing, seeing that it's an option. Um, and then you also have just the societal aspect of women being judged um, some oftentimes more harshly on appearance and more verbally on appearance than, than men are. Um, so that's definitely a, a negative, a negative aspect of being on social media as a woman. But so far it's not really been too much of an issue for me as of yet, which is, okay. which is nice. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's good. And sorry, we kind of got off track. I want to just double back to daily vlogging quickly. Um, I was going to ask you to about the importance of momentum when it comes to daily vlogging, because I'm assuming like once you make that first video and then the second, the third and the fourth, once you kind of have a good string of videos, that momentum will carry you into keeping to continue creating. Is that something that you found when you were filming? Yes, definitely. I think the huge part that I got from daily vlogging is kind of kicking a little bit of a perfectionism habit. Um, and I think when you get that momentum from the daily vlogging, when you're, I feel like once you're past like maybe like day 17 or like somewhere like after day 20, it's like, okay, I, you get in a bit of a rhythm a little bit. It can always be kicked off by a weird day or like be traveling or like doing something. You don't have access to the internet or or you just don't have the time to sit down or even for me, like a client shoot that goes like 16 hours, you know, and then what are you supposed to do for your daily vlog? Um, but yeah, the momentum is super important. Just kind of getting into a rhythm and accepting that this video would be better if I spent two more hours on it, but I simply can't. Um, that, that is huge in, in the, in the daily vlogging world. Um, which is something that still impacts how I create for my channel right now, which is really makes me glad that I started out daily vlogging as well. Mm -hmm. And I wrote down a quote here that you said about daily vlogging. I can't remember if I heard it on Babin's podcast or Javier's podcast, but you said that vlogging every day is easier than vlogging twice a week. Can you kind of explain that? Oh yeah. Um, I have yet to, like, I think my biggest streak right now since I stopped daily would be like, I think there was one month where I uploaded every week and I stopped vlogging in almost, I stopped daily vlogging 10 months ago. And so in those 10 months, I think there's only been one month where I've actually uploaded every week. (laughs) So it's, and I, and I daily vlogged for over a hundred days. It was just easier. First of all, you have, you have lower expectations on yourself for each video. Um, you just, it is about momentum. You're just, you're still going. There's not an option. You have to upload. You have to shoot something. You have to upload. Whereas when you have one video or two videos a week, it's like, you can put it off. You, oh, that's not good enough. Oh, I don't want to shoot that this day. The lighting's not good. Um, you just, you just lose track of time. Then all of a sudden it's like, oh, I should have uploaded yesterday. (laughs) And then then it's already passed. And then you're like, okay, well, um, what day of the week is best for me to upload on? You know, it's, it's all these like different things that you're constantly thinking about optimizing and doing better. And it's just, it's just a completely different process from daily vlogging. I wrote down one other quote here and you said you don't daily vlog for channel growth, but for personal growth. So what are some, how did you grow over that hundred plus day period when you were daily vlogging? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think at least from what I've heard at my couple times at Vid Summit and uh, different research and, and hearing different people talk about it is that, yeah, like the the daily vlogger growth era is pretty much over. But um, when I started on YouTube, it was like I had to script out every single word. So when I was doing those, like uh, right when I started the channel, it took so long to make a single video because I 
if I got the word wrong, like I would retake it, you know, and I would just do that over and over and over again. And it didn't result in like the best videos at all because it didn't seem natural at all. And I was just still trying to find my voice as well. So you're trying to find your voice. You're trying to find your comfort being in front of the camera. You're trying to find all these things. Um, but daily vlogging, you're just doing it every day. So practicing that and getting comfortable even vlogging outside of your studio and vlogging in the street like that all all of those factors contribute to you being more comfortable on camera and I I know for a fact that I wouldn't have been able to pull off that Casey video even and none of the videos since that video if if I hadn't been daily vlogging if I hadn't been practicing the craft of being your own character of being your own character and just being in front of the camera. Um, so in terms of developing your skills for being a YouTube creator, daily vlogging is, is one of the best ways to practice that. And in terms of actually being in front of the camera, what are your tips for vlogging in public? Cause that always, every time I've tried to vlog, that's been a huge barrier for me personally. Yeah. <laughs> um, Yes. Vlogging in public is super interesting. It's like weirdly terrifying and also no one cares. So like, why is it terrifying? These are great questions that I ask myself all the time. Um, you, you just have to do it enough. You just have to do it enough and, and build some sort of tolerance for realizing that nobody cares and you shouldn't care either. Um, I know that when I was vlogging in New York, uh, the last couple times that I was there, it it almost is easier to do it there because there's so many people and like actually you can tell that nobody cares. It's it's easier in New York than in LA even um, in Long Beach because there's just like only a couple people walking by and so they really notice you because you're like the only other person on the street and you're like, hi, I'm filming myself. Uh, this is super awkward. Um, but I think my only tip would be just do it more. <laughs> That's, I think, the only way to get over it. Does collaborating with other vloggers and other creators kind of normalize the feeling of vlogging in public? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's tip number two. Just find a buddy. <laughs> Just find somebody else that is also holding a camera. Then all of a sudden you turn in, like, you feel like you're you're not a weirdo on the street now. You're just like, this is obvious. Like, why aren't you vlogging? Like, to the people who walk by. Um, yeah, no, I think collaborating with other people is a huge way to just like normalize it. And if you haven't been to like a conference, like a video creator conference, um, or everybody's walking around with their camera and their gorilla pot or switch pot or whatever, that's a, that's a very unique experience, uh, for the first time is like, Oh wow, this is so cool. Uh, there are other people like me. So yeah, highly recommend that. And then so like, why did you ultimately stop doing the daily vlogs? I know your original intention was to do it for a year. You did it for over a hundred days, which is in its own right is impressive. But ultimately, why did you decide to end it early? Yeah, it was, um, I was working on that Casey video and trying to put a lot of time into that and give it kind of the energy that I thought it deserved, um, telling that story. And I also run a production company. And I'm also building a software company. <laughs> um, the answer is simple. Like I just, something had to give. I had to give up one of those things. And in terms of my goals and priorities, like daily vlogging was the one that was least contributing to um, financial and goals for the software company. So um, yeah, I just had to, it was weird. It, it took me like a I would say like three weeks of like intermittent uploads, like, like probably like three uploads a week or something to like, just admit <laughs> to myself even that I was done daily vlogging, um, making an active decision to just like focus on that one video and stop trying to like film a video in an hour and upload it and whatever. So yeah, it's a hard thing to admit to yourself failure in general. Um, but yeah. But speaking of failure, and like I didn't realize how many quotes I wrote down, but I have another one of yours that I want to ask you about is you wrote, I should fail, I have to fail. Why Like, why is that an important part of the process? I mean, I am a true believer in the fact that if you aren't failing, then you're probably not doing anything. Um, if It's just, we will fail. Like If, if you're trying to accomplish something great, you're, you're going to fail at times. Um, it's just a matter of 
learning from those failures and not not letting them bring you down and make you stop. You just have to keep going. And then over over that hundred plus day period when you were daily vlogging, was there ever a point where it almost ended earlier? Like, did you have a day that was just going so poorly or something where you didn't want to vlog, but you had to push through? Was there a day ever like that? Oh yeah, for sure. A lot, <laughs> a lot of days like that. Um, I, I would say the entire hundred day period of daily vlogging, most of my, most of my vlogs were uploaded at like 1157. <laughs> like it was like, it was a race. And a lot of the people, you know, the hundred people that were like, OG supporters, they always like watch my video in the morning, you know, like, the, it, and a lot of them were like, why don't you just schedule it to upload in the morning? I'm like, it doesn't work like that. If I, if I plan to upload it in the morning, then I'll just be up until 6am editing it, you know? Um, so yeah, there were a lot of, a lot of days like that. Um, I've told the story a few times. I was, it was Thanksgiving and I was super sick and obviously didn't feel like filming a video that day. So, um, my wife was just like, go out to the studio, shoot a video on the, on the ground and just upload it. And I was like, oh, okay. And so I literally laid on the ground in my studio and I talked about gratitude and I barely edited at all. And I uploaded it. And, um, my, my now very good friend, Adrian commented on that one. It was like, I feel like this is the most authentic Alex we've ever seen. And I love it. Like, so it's just like all of these things that like feel like failures at the time can, when you look back at them actually be moments where you learned a lot. Like I feel like in that video, um, like I really found a little bit more of my voice because I couldn't be on, I couldn't be YouTube Alex. I was just me. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I think a lot of times, a lot of times to answer your question, close to failure. I'm glad, <laughs> sorry, I'm glad, I'm glad you brought up the authentic piece. Cause I actually wrote that down. Cause I watched quite a few of your videos in preparation for this. And other than the Casey video, I was going to say that, my, that your sick video was probably my favorite one just because of how authentic you were in that video. And it was kind of like a takeaway for me was to kind of like just stop caring so much and you'll come across as more authentic in your video. So I just kind of want to point that out that that was one of my favorite videos of yours that you did. But you also mentioned there that the sick video was about gratitude. And so you said you practice gratitude. So how how does that look for you? Like, how do you practice gratitude? Yeah, it's changed throughout the years. Um, my practice of gratitude actually started in college because um, my senior year, my coach basically started every practice um, with attitude of gratitude. So we all had to say something that we were grateful for about a teammate. Um, and that was the first time I really had experienced that in that way. And I actually started a gratitude journal Um immediately when I, when I finished college. Um, and I've kind of kept up that practice in different ways since 2014 then. Um, right now I have something called an Evo planner. I'm a big fan of, uh, their products. And so I have a daily, a daily sheet in that planner that includes, uh, gratitude. Um, so I just list out and I kind of open thought on everything that I'm grateful for each morning. And so how has practicing gratitude changed your life? Great question. Um, it just changes your mindset. Just even starting every day. I, I did have a planner for a while where it was starting every day and finishing every day with gratitude. And I'd like to maybe get back into that um, evening gratitude as well. But it's just like starting your day with thinking about what's good in your life, thinking about things that you're thankful for and things that, yeah, just things that are good. It just changes your mindset from negativity. It, it brings in positivity into your life and it just shifts, it just shifts your mindset. And I think that's important for the work that we do in staying positive because it's so easy to get down on yourself. Um, even if you, if you had a less productive day, like there's so many ways that that can there are so many things that can bring you down as uh, independent entrepreneur creator. It's just so important to really think positively. So I think gratitude does that for me. Absolutely, but like speaking of things that don't keep you positive or things that can drag you down, can you talk about the grind of being a smaller YouTuber where it's not your full time? You have a full time job. There's other things you're working on, and you're a YouTube creator. Can you kind of talk about that grind? 
Yeah, honestly, I can't imagine how I can't grasp how people with full time jobs do YouTube at all. And then adding a lot of people that have kids on top of that. I have no understanding of how these people are pulling it off. I am overly impressed by (laughs) their grind um, in comparison to mine, which is I don't have a full time, a full time job. I have a very flexible schedule because I run my own production company. Um, so I'm, I'm always choosing my own schedule. If I don't want to do that shoot, I have to do YouTube instead. Like I don't do that shoot. Um, but it, my, my problem really is just juggling too many hats. So I have my production company that's, um, bringing in income and then I have my software company that I'm building and that's where the income goes (laughs) because I'm investing in that. And then I have YouTube, which is, um, really, really basically creating content and, um, building up a personal brand for that software company in the future. So those two are very much entwined together, but it's, it's hard to balance. A lot of people ask me, um, just like how, how I balance all of that. And my answer honestly is just like, I don't, (laughs) um, (laughs) like it's a constant battle and I'm always messing around with how to be more productive or how to be more um, intentional about the time that I'm spending on different tasks and trying to like block, block schedule time. Like this four hours tomorrow, I'm working on this business. And then the next four hours I'm working on that business. But especially when you have clients, you're doing different stuff, like that's constantly changing. Um, so yeah, my answer is that I, I I don't balance it. I just try my best not to like drop any balls. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. And do you ever do you ever have to taper your expectations when it comes to getting views and maybe not necessarily getting the views you think that a video should be getting? Is that ever something you have to worry about and deal with? Oh, for sure. Yeah. I mean, I'm constantly like spending money on videos and um, think they're going to do really well and then they just don't. And the, like I've I've totally had to shift my expectations and um almost like self-protect because it's like, if that doesn't do great, like it's okay. Like that's fine. You really enjoyed that project. Um, and that has, that has to be fine. And that's been a very, a very long process of kind of shifting that mindset as well of like, you're, you're not just doing this because you are trying to build a personal brand. You're doing this because you really love it. Um, and people always say that when you're starting out, you're like, Oh, like tips for starting a YouTube channel videos, right? It's like, only do this if you really love it. It's like, yeah, 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 yeah. Lucky for me, like I do, but if you don't love making YouTube videos, definitely don't start a YouTube channel because it is hard. It is a grind. And the only thing that can keep you going through all of it is because would I make this if no one would see it? And if the answer is yes, then you're golden. (laughs) And what is that balance then of creating content that you enjoy versus like the content that people want to see? Like I know like the most viewed videos on your channel outside of the Casey one tutorials. I think I've heard you say that you enjoy making the tutorials, but like what's that balance of creating content that you know will get views versus content that you want to make? For sure. Um, I'm still figuring that out, honestly, Um, because I don't want to be a tutorial and gear review channel. But I also do have a passion for like sharing what I've learned over the years. So I, yeah, I do enjoy those, but I don't want my, my channel focused on those pieces of content. So I'm still, I'm still trying to figure out where that balance is on my channel and, and what people are going to enjoy watching the most. Um, and honestly, just looking at channels that inspire me and um their storytelling and how are they balancing it i look a lot at like dan mace and his storytelling ability and the film like the series and the films that he's making are a lot are are very related to what i want to do on my channel and he obviously doesn't do like he doesn't do any like gear reviews or tutorials or anything for the most part um but yeah just I I don't always talk a lot about comparison because I think comparison is a beast of its own and can be a really negative thing in your life. But in terms of just like looking at different channels that are, are where you are, want to, they are where you want to be. Um, I, I spend some time doing that, um, in terms of figuring out what I want my channel to be and how I can balance that content in that way. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a tough one. I'm still figuring it out. 
And so like, what's your current YouTube process? I think you said you upload weekly-ish right now. Yeah, (laughs) weekly-ish. I think before my last video, which I just uploaded on Monday, it had been almost three weeks um, with all the holidays and everything. I really did that poorly. I did it really, really badly this year. Um, Because everyone's like, okay, last, last video before 2020 or whatever. And like I did that, but I also didn't account for being super busy during the holidays. I should have batched it and I should have had content ready to upload in January. So yeah, I took three weeks without uploading, which was really, it's like whenever you know you should be uploading, but you don't have anything ready yet, it's like really, you feel, you beat yourself up, or at least I do. Um, You're just like, man, I really need to be uploading today. I don't have anything. Okay. All right. Moving on. Keep working. Keep going, you know? Mm-hmm. And is, is batching something you typically try to do so that you're always kind of putting a new video every week? Or are you filming a new video like week to week, basically? I would love to batch my content. Um, <laughs> I have not yet accomplished <laughs> that process. Um, right now I have, it's been a constant joke. Like I have videos that I filmed in July that are like bigger videos that are more story based that I haven't edited yet. Um, I think right now I have like eight videos that I've filmed and haven't edited, but they're all like docu-series, like different type of stuff like that. Um, so they're almost all more of like along the lines of that Casey video that I put out and that one, as I, you know, as we know, took over three months to edit. Um, so when you have like eight videos that are all like on that same kind of level, it's hard to figure out when to schedule them in and and how much time to put into editing them and balancing that with other content that you can, that I can shoot in a day and edit and put out the next day. So yeah, I'm not batching content right now. I'm just, I'm just holding on for dear life. (laughs) That's fair. But uh, like in terms of like, we're talking a lot about editing, but I also kind of want to shift a little bit to things once you've finished editing, because it's not like you finish the edit, you export it, you upload it. There's a couple things that have to come before that. It's like, what is important for you when it comes to creating thumbnails? Oof. I'm still working on that. All your questions. You're just, you're just calling me out. I'm still working on all of it. No, I love it. Um, yeah, thumbnails. I actually finally, over the last like four months, I feel like the ones that I've shot, the videos that I've shot, I've actually remembered, okay, shoot a thumbnail. Um, so that's good. That's always a good thing. Um, for me, well, I, I listened. Did you go to Vid Summit? No. So Mr. Beast gave a talk at Vid Summit. He was a keynote speaker. And um, he had a few tips on thumbnails, which has kind of been what I've been trying to implement a little bit. Um, but I think the number one thing is that it should be... <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what a thumbnail should be. But like he, he suggests like not like your thumbnail should tell the story of what your video is without text. Um, I still fail at that, but that's kind of what I'm gauging my thumbnails off of these days. I'm like, that's like my North star on thumbnails. I'm like, can I get something out of this thumbnail that says what the video is? Yeah. I don't know. That's, that's what I can share from my, what I learned at Vid Summit. So. That's fair. But I think it's, I think it's a cool thing for you just to say, like, just to say, I don't know. Right. Because from the outside, people might think that like, you know what you're doing, but not everyone knows what they're doing, right? So from the outside, things might look great, but on the inside, you never know what's going on. So I think it's cool to hear you say that you don't necessarily know. But I was going to ask too, like, does it when it comes to like your description and tags, do you put a lot of work in there as well? Or do you focus more so on the thumbnail and the video itself? I would say I focus more on uh, keywords and tags in like pre-production. Um, I definitely think more about that stuff than the thumbnail, which it's probably not the right way to do it, but I actually did have some success in, um, I collaborated with a friend, Jake Frew, and he is a full-time van lifer filmmaker. And, um, when we met, when we started talking last year, he was, I think it was after my case video. So I had like 3000 subscribers. He had like 800 and we, we had been trying to connect for a while. And so this last fall he was in LA Um, on a bit of a van trip and so we finally got the chance to collaborate he was at he had had one video explode when he finally finished his van and he did a van tour 
and that one exploded. So he was at like 20,000 subscribers when we finally collaborated this fall. And we did a ton of keyword research. I used Morning Fame and we, we researched the crap out of these two videos and ended up his was like a solo B-roll one and mine was a um, cinematic sequence uh, keyword video. And that one did really, really well on his channel and that drove a lot of traffic to my channel. So that keyword research definitely paid off. We spent like three hours. Like we were supposed to shoot this collab in one day and we had like five hours to shoot it. And we instead spent three hours keyword researching and planning the actual like keywords of the video and the titles and stuff. Um, and that totally paid off, which was really fun to see. And he had never actually done that on his channel. And so I think that one's over 200,000 views now. And he's grown in the last like three months to now he just hit 50,000 subscribers. So that was that was cool to see. Wow, that's awesome. Can you share kind of like some of the couple like high level key points from your research into keywords? Unless you don't, unless you want to keep it like your secret, but if you want to share, that'd be awesome. Yeah. Um, I'd say like the real moment when keyword research clicked for me was when I switched to using Morning Fame. I think it depends on what, on what tool you use. Um, and how they kind of present the information because I had been using TubeBuddy and I think it's a really great tool. I still use it for some things, but in terms of keyword research, Morning Fame like takes you through this whole process um, and you kind of say what you think the title could be um, and then it tells you like, that's crap, don't choose that. <laughs> so you have to like kind of like keep trying different combinations and then they're really showing, they give you like a grade, right? So it really just tells you okay, that's actually a good fit. Like that might work. Um, and then they take you like a, a four step process. So really my process is just following what, what morning fame tells me and then adding in a little bit of like, um, just trend, like trends that I see happening on other people's channels, um, and how they're phrasing things. And, um, I mean, it, at the end, at the end of the day, it's kind of a guessing game, but you can use these tools to guide, guide your guess if that makes sense um i think that's that's the best info i have i don't have a i don't have a secret i don't really think there is a secret i think it's it's all a game and you can just try your best to win fair enough but speaking of the game and trying your best to win would is going full time like a main goal of yours when it comes to youtube um <clears throat> I would like to be able to do less client work um, and supplement some income from YouTube in that way. But I mean, my my main goal here is I'm building a software company um, and that serves creators. So that goes back to your original question also, why I wanted to start YouTube, um, because I wanted to be seen as a peer on YouTube. Um, so I feel like I've done pretty well building a network on YouTube because I was daily vlogging. Um, so yeah, that goal of just like being seen as a creator on YouTube by my fellow creators, that is a goal. Um, but yeah, in terms of going full time, like that will never be my full time job because I'm building up the software company. Um, I would love to stop producing for clients that that would be great. Uh, so whichever, whichever builds the revenue first, I guess. Um, YouTube versus a software company, it'll probably be YouTube. So we'll see. I, I, a goal is also to do branded content as well and work with some partners on my channel to act as an example for how you can collaborate with both brands and nonprofits to tell impact stories because that's what my software is all about is telling uh, meaningful storytelling um, from YouTubers and content creators while they are collaborating with brands and nonprofits. Um, so I, I just want to produce stories like that, that serve as examples, um, as well. So, so sorry, your, your software company is called Lofty, correct? Correct. And so how long have you been working on Lofty? I started concepting Lofty while I was in grad school, actually. Um, so it would have been like 2017. Um, so it's morphed a lot during that time and since then, um, I'd say I've been working on Lofty for, I mean, technically over a year. So technically I really started full throttle on Lofty like in October, last October 
or 2018. October of 2018. Um, so I've been working on it for a long time. It's such a hard balance between, I mean, software is just super expensive and time consuming. So it's hard to balance that like income versus, you know, expenses on that side of it. Um, so yeah, I guess like a year, year and a half. Okay. And are you, so you mentioned how with software it's time consuming and expensive. So how are you kind of operating with that company? Are you raising money? Are you kind of subsidizing it with money coming in from client work? Like, what does that look like? How is Lofty kind of operating as a business right now? Yeah, it's all bootstrapped at this point. Um, I have some friends that are in software design and UX design and stuff. So we've been working together. Um, paid, obviously, but um, more forgiving than <laughs> than hiring strangers as well. Uh, yeah, the Lofty is not making any money at this point um, by by any means. I'm investing client client work money into that. That's fair. And then you started a new series on your YouTube. This um, what's it called here? I wrote it down. Collab for a cause, right? Yeah. And is that kind of related to Lofty in a sense? So you're almost creating content that's associated to Lofty to kind of gain exposure to the company? Is that kind of the idea behind it? Yeah, I'm kind of like vamping up until when we're going to be launching the beta of Lofty. Um, just kind of gaining or putting putting out just content that has a cause attached to it, has impact behind it. Um, so the series is basically um, connecting with a different creator each episode. And, and I asked them what what cause they're most passionate about. And it's astounding to me how different everyone's answers are. Um, and, uh, so basically we take, take that creator on a different like impact experience. So it can, it's different every episode. Um, but yeah, I'm excited about that storytelling and just getting the, getting different creators involved in the causes that they care about and kind of showing both them and their audience that you can involve these things into your content um and include that and it actually all the statistics show that you know audiences react really well to cause-based content um and are more likely to share it and just all these really great things audiences love it you can feel more fulfillment in your job as a creator by getting involved in these causes um so that's kind of the basis of the series is just to my first kind of taking a step into that into that space on my own channel as well and and what is an impact experience? Like, what does that look like? Uh, can you give an example of kind of how that would go? Yeah, yeah. So, so far it's been different every episode. But so the first episode, I invited LA creators to a creator dinner at Venice Beach. And before the dinner, we handed out socks to the homeless population in Venice. So socks and wet wipes and granola bars and different things that are kind of like an essential pack for the homeless population there. Um, the second episode that I just put out before the holidays was, um, a really fun one that also, um, was kind of one that I invested money into and didn't get the results that I was hoping or expecting, um, that we talked about earlier, but it was, I can't remember what it's called, but like YouTubers get nostalgic unboxing childhood tech. Um, so got a bunch of YouTubers all around the world, well, mostly Canada and the U S and they, uh, told me like three different childhood tech that they loved and I shipped them one of them and they unboxed it on camera. Um, so that was a collaboration with a nonprofit called Human IT who uh, refurbishes and distributes used tech to um, low-income families mostly, um, people who need them. So um, those are like two examples that we've published so far. I have a couple that are in line to be edited um, that involve like human trafficking, blood donation, and like all these different things that creators are really passionate about and don't always get an opportunity or don't feel like they have the opportunity to talk about those aspects of their, of their life and their passions on their channels. Wow. That's awesome. Yeah. It's that's been really awesome. fun. I love that. So when can we expect the lofty beta to come out? 2020. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm holding off from saying a date to be honest, because it's just like, it's like, totally unpredictable right now so but 2020 for sure that's awesome and what about other social platforms outside of youtube are they a big factor in your strategy at all when it comes to even video promotion or anything like that like instagram i think is your biggest outside of youtube yes yeah it definitely i always try to post either on stories or uh in the feed for when i put out a video and um on instagram i mean and i that that's where I spend most of my time is on Instagram. 
and I love stories. And I think it's a super powerful platform. I also love Twitter and that's where I connect on a personal basis with a lot of creators in this community. Um, Twitter is an amazing place f- just for conversation and, and I love that platform as well. And then TikTok is there. <laughs> I, have, I, have, I started a TikTok. I think I uploaded two videos or something. Um, it's something that I'm very interested in, in getting involved in, but still trying to figure out what the heck is going on there. So, Yeah, for sure. It's definitely an interesting platform, to say the least. And like back with Instagram, did photography kind of come at the same time as videography did, or did it kind of come after the fact? Definitely after the fact. I've just gone in, into photography maybe like, I guess I would say like the last year and a half. I mean, always I feel like when you're doing any visual arts and as a videographer and you already know how to use your camera and vice versa, if you're already a photographer, like it's, you already have the eye, you know, I mean, all my, my family's always had me take the photo versus like them taking the photo. Um, when like, if you're in a touristy place and somebody asks you to take their photo. They're like, ah, she can do it. Like have her do it. She's the pro. Even though I was a videographer, right? I feel like we all have those experiences, but actually taking photography seriously a little bit more. Um, yeah, probably, probably when I started YouTube is when I started to have a lot more fun with photography and, and shooting and shooting raw. Um, when I got my, uh, got into the Sony family, definitely started shooting raw and playing around more with Lightroom and Photoshop and having more fun with it in that way. So what what's harder to tell a story with, a photo or video? Oh, photo for me, yeah. But it's like it's so cool. I I love the people that are really telling a story with the carousels on Instagram. I think that's really fun, just using photos. Um, I also think that photos can capture emotion in a really unique and different way from video. Um, I think my first experience with that was like when we won the national championship and we had a really great photographer there and you can just capture this exact one single moment like this in this still photo that like encompasses it better than you could ever with like a 10, a 10 second video clip. Um, yeah, I think they're both just so unique and you can tell a story in a different way with each one. And I think they're, they're both so powerful. Mm-hmm. And as your photography style, would you say it's similar to your video style or do they really have kind of, they're kind of independent of each other? I would say that I don't have a photography style right now. Um, still experimenting, still playing around with it. I feel like I've been doing video for 10 years and just started playing around with photography a little over a year ago um, and taking it more seriously. And it took me nine years to really find my voice as a videographer I think so I'm not expecting to figure that out in photo anytime soon um so just keep playing and I just recommend that for anybody who's starting to learn to use a camera it's just like keep playing and just and you'll figure it out eventually um you just have to experiment with different styles and have fun with it and you'll figure it out what what's one thing you hope people take away from your content I hope people feel inspired to do something after they see my content I guess um and to take it a step further maybe to do something good um and to just feel like they shouldn't they shouldn't not try like I feel like especially recently um I've been trying to make more videos about um the actual process and and the emotion behind creating um I always think that every single person has a story to tell and so if you're willing and if you're you're excited to tell that story, you should. And nothing should hold you back. So I, I hope that people take that away from my content. It's just feel inspired to go do something. I like that. I really like that. And bef- before we wrap up here, I usually ask everyone the same standard set of questions before the end of every episode. Okay. Kind of, I used to call it rapid fire, but then no one was answering the questions fast. <laughs> and I started calling it a Q&A, but then I was like, it's a podcast and the whole thing's the whole like a thing Q&A. It's a Q&A, I like it. <laughs> yeah. Um, but either way, so the first one being, you're going to dinner, you can take three people. It can be anybody dead or alive. Who do you take to dinner? Oh, no. Okay. <laughs> um. Holy cow. Okay. Maybe I have it. Okay. I think Sophia Bush would be my number one. Many people might not know who she is, but she's an actress and activist. Um, she starred in One Tree Hill, uh, which is when I first saw her, but she's also been in Chicago PD, and now she's um, more more of an activist, and she has a podcast as well called Work in Progress. Um, she's like she's like my number one person that I, I want to connect with and, and get on my platform when it's 
when it's ready because she's super powerful and, and an awesome badass woman. Um, Sophia Bush. Let's see who else. <sighs> Maybe Casey Neistat because I also would really like to connect with him and talk about his his goals um, in terms of impact because he inspired me with his work with nonprofits and Boys and Girls Club and different stuff. And I think he would be really interested um, to collaborate and probably, honestly, my wife, because if I'm going to dinner with those people, then she should be there. <laughs> yeah, I love that. What What's some of the best advice you've ever gotten? Mm. Yeah, these are not rapid fire questions. So good call and no. not calling them <laughs> rapid fire. Uh, I would say success is earned one day at a time. When your alarm when your alarm goes off in the morning, what's what motivates you to get up and out of bed? Ooh. <laughs> um, I feel very fortunate because like I love what I'm doing every day. So there is not really a struggle to get out of bed. So I guess just um, looking for looking forward to what I have to do that day, which also, if anyone's interested, planning out your if you're if you're working for yourself, plan out your day and your in your tasks the night before, because then you know exactly what you're doing when you wake up. Um, so, yeah, I guess I'm already excited about what I'm creating that day. So that's my answer. Mm -hmm. I definitely agree. I don't work for myself, but I've started planning out my day more thoroughly. Even for when I come home from work, I know exactly what I got to do and when I'm going to do it. And it's been so, so beneficial. It's, it's been so good. It's life-changing, to be honest. What is one thing about you people wouldn't expect? I never <laughs> rewatch my videos. Like Sometimes not even before I upload them after I finished editing. <laughs> it's maybe different. I like hate. I hate watching myself on youtube so what's one thing that's so important everyone needs to know oh damn um i'd say we kind of talked about it already but like failure is key failure is everything you have to fail the last question i kind of like to flip the script a little bit so instead of me asking the question it's you asking the question but it's not to me so pretend you have a crystal ball and you can ask this crystal ball any question and when you ask it this question, you'll get the answer, the 100% honest, the truth. What is one question you want to know the answer to? <laughs> um, if and when the earth will no longer support human life. <laughs> I'm always curious to see what direction people take that question. I don't think anyone's quite gone in that direction yet. <laughs> I think it's super important because we're nearing that time when uh it may not matter what i you know what i have planned for the next 50 years like it may not matter at all so i'd like to know i would like to know totally fair but i want to thank you for taking the time to be on the podcast i want to give you the floor where can the people find you plug anything and everything that you got right now definitely youtube uh nearing 10,000 subscribers which has been really fun if you want to check me out there maybe i don't know when this is going up maybe i'll already be past it uh, next to that is Instagram at Alex Gassaway um, and Twitter at I'm Alex Gassaway. But that's it. Awesome. I want to thank you once again for coming on the podcast. I want to thank everybody for listening. Whether you've listened the entire way through, you've only listened to bits and pieces. I really appreciate you taking time to check this out. Everyone, do me a favor. Go and follow Alex. Go subscribe to her YouTube channel. Make sure everything's linked in the show notes down below. And if you'd like to follow me, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at the Jacob Kelly. Feel free to come and say hello. My DMs are always open. And if you'd like to follow the podcast, you can find us on Instagram at My Social Life Podcast or on YouTube by searching up My Social Life. Thank you once again for listening, everybody. We'll talk soon.